Y'all hear me okay now? Okay. I'm going to start three prayer letters around. All right, I'm glad to be back with you. I heard y'all had an interesting time last Wednesday night, something a little different and challenging, but um, from the ones who've told me about it, y'all enjoyed it, so I'm thankful for that. But we're going to get back into Timothy tonight, and uh, we, don't, we don't like too much. We're going to finish up the fifth chapter uh, this evening, um, if we get through this evening's study, um, and then we'll be in chapter six, finishing up First Timothy and I'm telling y'all, buddy, maybe you get ready for a break from Timothy before we jump into 2 Timothy, because whew, these topics are heavy, uh, it seems like, through 1 Timothy. So we may want a little break from Timothy before and hit something for a couple of weeks before we come back to 2 Timothy. Really? Okay, good, good. Well, that's encouraging. But the, the lessons are tough ones, and tonight's no different. Uh, probably a topic that's um, an important one, but I think probably one that's difficult. And, and as a pastor, it's a topic that's hard for a pastor to teach, um, but we'll, we'll kind of work through it this evening. Um, so if you have your Bible tonight, we're going to be in the fifth chapter, verses 17 through 25, um, kind of finishing up. This whole section, you'll notice in your Bible, talks about elders um, really, really pertains. So what's the difference between elders and deacons in the Bible? Uh, that's sometimes confusing when you're studying God's word. Um, we know what deacons are. Uh, we have deacons in our church today. Um, they're usually um, lay ministers is what they are that serve in the church and undergird the work of the ministry uh, to the congregation. Generally, when you see elders or bishops in the Bible, it's talking about what today we would call a preacher, professional clergy, so um, this uh, section we're going to be looking at tonight um, really kind of deals with uh, pastors, but I've titled this, this evening's uh, lesson, Church Leadership, Keeping It Godly, and so we're going to kind of look at some of that. I'm going to remind you tonight, um, especially because we took a break, of just some of the background material um, to 1 Timothy. Um, Y'all know I like to repeat that stuff often. It's helpful for me to kind of keep in my mind kind of what we're dealing with in this letter um, and, and kind of helps us to kind of understand why what is being written is being written, um, gives us some context to it. So uh, kind of review some of that tonight. There's also another method to my madness in that repeating it in that I think some of what we'll talk about tonight will give us an understanding of why Paul is writing verses 17 through 25 to Timothy. Um, it's an interesting section that he writes because Timothy is a pastor. Um, he's, he's the pastor of the church at Ephesus, remember? And that's, that's the church that um, Paul's dealing with. And he's actually addressing pastors. And so there's some confusion there. Is he talking about a problem that Timothy had? Or is he talking about something Timothy was having to deal with concerning leadership within the church there at Ephesus, and why was that important? So uh, we'll look at some of that. Remember that uh, 1 Timothy is a letter written by Paul, but it's an interesting letter, a little dip, bit different than Paul's other letters in the New Testament. As we've shared through this study, and if you're familiar with the New Testament, you know Paul wrote probably the largest portion of the New Testament, and all of the, his writings are letters written in different contexts, uh, most of his letters are written to specific churches uh, for a reason. Um, I would say that the number one reason usually Paul wrote to a church was because of false teaching uh, dealing with that subject. So you read letters like uh, the book of Ephesians in the New Testament, the book of Philippians, the book of Colossians, the book of Galatians. All of those books are written to specific churches. Some of them were circular, so they were written, written to um, several churches, uh, example it would be Galatians and Colossians were written to multiple churches to be circulated among them. But most of his letters 
that's the context. They're, they're written to specific churches. Um, now, First and Second Timothy and Titus are different in that they're personal letters written to specific individuals rather than churches. I think that's a, a noteworthy background uh, kind of statement when you're studying these letters. Because here's what you see us doing all the time with letters like 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus. We're trying to build doctrine out of them when actually what Paul's writing is to pastors at how to handle problems in those churches. You see, so they're a little bit different than what you read when you read a letter he wrote to a church. So I always think that's a, a very interesting context statement. Um, and, and I think it actually helps us with 1 Timothy because, you know, Timothy deals with some pretty hard-hitting stuff, like what's the role of women in the church? That's one of them we dealt with. Um, what's the role of deacons in the church? And he spends a lot of time talking about that kind of stuff. Well, when you understand the background, you get why. Because Timothy needs to know as a pastor, how do I handle these issues that are coming up in these churches that are causing division, okay? So that, that kind of gives you some context of that. So we've, we've emphasized that one a lot. Um, so this is called a pastoral epistle. It's very pastoral in nature. That is that um, when you go to seminary as a pastor, you take a course that's called pastoral care. It's like how to deal with problems in the church, right? And so these pastoral letters are, subjected, are subjects of pastoral care. They're, how, do we, how do we deal with that? Um, tonight's study is going to be no different. How do we deal with erring church leaders, erring leadership in the church? How do we deal with erring pastors and ministers? How do we deal with leadership in the church that errs? And, and so we'll get into that a little bit tonight, which I think is an interesting topic, but it's not an easy topic. To dialogue about. Um, so we'll kind of talk about that just a little bit. Remember that this letter was actually written to address problems in the church. And, and both 1st and 2nd Timothy um, were written by Paul towards the end of his life. I, I kind of feel like encouraging Timothy. He's young because uh, Timothy's going to have to kind of carry on the legacy of Paul. And so he, he wants him to be strong in the Lord. So that's just a little bit of background without us kind of going into all the details we did before. There's uh, the four or five reminders uh, that we've been giving you every week that kind of remind you of uh, some of the context um, um, of these letters. So that probably helps just a little bit. Okay. So tonight we're going to be in verses 17 through 25. If you've got your Bible there, um, let's, let's take a look at this. Um, remember, um, chapter five is an interesting chapter. Uh, the first four chapters, really, he's been kind of encouraging Timothy, who seems a little bit uh, passive, maybe timid, timid somewhat. Um, he's young, so maybe easily intimidated by a lot of the problems. And so the first four chapters are really, I think, although there's some kind of deep doctrinal questions going on, kind of encouraging Timothy how to handle these. Um, when you get to chapter five, um, it becomes real practical. You begin to see some of what's happening. In, in the first part of this chapter, up until chapter 17 uh, to verse 17, I mean, you'll see kind of talks about widows and how to handle those who have needs uh, because evidently within the church, that was an issue. And now pick up in verse 17, um, he's going to talk about church leadership, how to treat them, how to deal with problems with leadership. Um, here's something we need to keep in the back of our minds. Pastors are human just like people sitting in the pew. They make mistakes, they fail, they fall. Um, every single one of us are sinners. Christians are sinners saved by God's grace, which means we didn't deserve it, right? So we're gonna all have struggles and failings. And so I think seasoned with grace and mercy, we read passages like this, at how, how do we handle uh, problems within the church? And so he's gonna address that. So if you've got your Bible, look at it with me if you would. Beginning in verse 17, we'll read on down till to the end of the chapter. Um, some pretty tough stuff here, but we'll try to pick through it, kind of dig apart with it a little bit, ask some questions, uh, kind of share some thoughts this evening. So uh, here we go, verse 17. Now notice I'll use the word elders, and remember the context I told you, that's referring to pastors um, or professional clergy, uh, ministers. This could also be applied to all church leadership. So 
We might say this could be applied to deacons. This could be applied to those who take leadership positions in churches. How do you hold them accountable? How do you, how do you deal with that? Okay, here's what he writes. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the world and word and doctrine. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain and the laborer is worthy of his wages. This is a pretty famous passage in 1 Timothy. That's where we get the idea of professional clergymen, that you know, a person who's called to the ministry, who serves the church is worthy to be supported in that. And so this passage is often used to support paying pastors or paying ministers. And we go, well, where does that come from? This is the passage that's most often quoted with that. Then verse 19, he starts to kind of pick up some of the problems maybe that um, Timothy was encountering in the church and churches around Ephesus. Um, so look at this. He says, do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning, and he's still talking about elders, pastors, ministers here, those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear. We'll, drive, we'll kind of pick this apart in a minute and explain what he's talking about. Verse 21, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. And um, this is a passage of scripture that um, helps many to kind of come to the conclusions that probably Timothy uh, kind of probably had some health issues himself. Um, when I read it, I think... Um, he probably was stressed to the max and had stomach ulcers, you know, from pastor in this troubled church as such a young guy. And so Timothy's saying, Timothy, Paul's saying, Timothy, you got to take care of yourself. All right. And the best medicine, he kind of tells him what to take there. Take a little wine for your stomach. Okay. Verse 24, some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment. But those of some, but those of some men follow later. Um, likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. All right. So there's the passage and you can tell just reading that passage, that's some pretty heavy stuff, right? That's that there, he's addressing something that's not easy. Um, and as I said, beginning in chapter five, he's going to get kind of down to the point. These are some of the specific issues that are going on um, in the church and, and, Paul's going to give him some pretty straightforward advice um, at how, how to deal with that. Now, when you read this passage, it's pretty easy to see evidently something was wrong in the church, right? Um, he's given him some pretty specific stuff, stuff here about confronting that and how to confront it and how it ought to be done when you have church leadership that's erring. We know that one of the problems facing the church at Ephesus this time was false teaching and that Perhaps many of the leaders had begun to kind of give in to some of that false teaching, maybe even promoting it and teaching some of it. So that may be some of the instructions here saying, you know, confront that. Don't, don't allow that to go on. And now remember what we said about the church at Ephesus. This was a very strategic church in the spread of the gospel. Okay. So this church in Paul's mind needed to be doctrinally pure if the gospel was going to be accurate and was going to spread from there. And so this would be very important in his mind. So he's saying, okay, listen, if the leadership, those who are preaching and teaching to others, who are raising others up to understand God's truth, if they're erring or they're sinning, it's got to be dealt with. Okay. So that's, that's important. And, and we need to understand it. I think a question for us today is how important is that for us today? I'm going to kind of start with just a couple of questions here. I want to throw a couple of these discussion questions out for you to think about um, tonight, and then we'll get a little bit more into the study. So these are some pretty good things. Um, think about this. Um, when is it proper to um, expose false teaching by a Christian author or well-known leader? When is, it, when is it proper to do that? Expose 
false teaching by a Christian author or a well-known leader? When is it proper to do that? Soon as it happens. When is it proper to, to expose it? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely when it's leading others astray. I think we should always expose it. I think we should call false false, right? Um, if, if they're, and listen, the market today is flooded with Christian books. Y'all know that. Walk in my office sometimes. I've got good ones and I've got terrible ones, okay? And, and, and some of them I buy on purpose because I know they're off because I want to see what's being promoted out there in our churches today. There's a lot of false teaching in our churches today, a lot. Um, and I could call some of it by name, but it would all be stuff that you're familiar with. I think that false teaching, that it's proper to expose it as soon as it's known, um, as, as soon as it's out there. And for the very reason Carolyn said, because there's baby Christians in our churches that can be very confused and led astray um, by false teaching. Um, so that, that's an important one. So that kind of leads, that one question kind of leads into uh, something I want us to think about tonight. Um, when, when you ask the question today, and we've talked about this even in the regard to this study, there was obviously something wrong in the church at Ephesus. Um, when you ask today, what's wrong with the church? You're liable to get all kinds of answers, right? Um, we might get everything from, uh, um, you know, culturally influenced uh, and, and they're not preaching the gospel anymore. Rather, they're, they're preaching things that are in the world. You know, we might hear that. Um, we might hear that the church has been liberalized. On the other side, we might hear the church has become very legalistic in some sections. Um, you can hear almost anything. Sometimes you'll hear, well, the church today is too entertainment-based. So think about that. When you talk about what's wrong with the church today, you're liable to get all kinds of varied responses. It seems to me that most people that go to church and are familiar with church life, most people kind of feel in their gut like there's something amiss with the church when we can have churches on every corner and yet see the drift in our country. We're not having the impact. Most Christians kind of go, it's pretty obvious there's something wrong, but we can't put our finger on exactly what it is. And so I want to kind of, this kind of starts here tonight too, ask you that question in your opinion, um, what do you think's wrong with the church today? I mean, Paul's addressing the issue here with Timothy. In your mind, when you think about it, it's, it's really hard. And I know this is very subjective in what we're sharing tonight, but in your mind, when you think about what's, what's wrong with the church today, just share some of your thoughts, what you think might be wrong with the church today. Generally speaking, Wes. Okay. Get, getting away from God's word and onto many other things. Like what things are you thinking of? Like, okay. Sometimes entertainment stuff through music. Okay. But, but putting everything ahead of the about programs, um, ideologies of the world that kind of get promoted out there. Okay, what else? Anybody else thoughts about that? Yes, Kathy. Too seeker friendly. Okay, that's a very good way to put that. Um, there's articles out that talk about how the church ought to be seeker, seeker friendly, but they've taken it to a whole extreme to where they don't want to make seekers uncomfortable by speaking the truth. You know, they don't. They they want them to feel so welcome that they don't call sin sin, and they don't they don't talk about the reality of hell, and they don't talk about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They don't talk about there's only one way. Seeker friendly churches will often promote there's more than one way. So that's a, a very good way to to say that. Other thoughts? What in your mind? We look at the church. We see the church isn't having the impact that it should. What's what's wrong with the church? Anybody else thoughts about that? Okay. Okay. Kind of losing our younger generation sometimes. Okay. All right. Anybody else thoughts about that? Yes, sir.
Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, Passion. We've lost our passion and we've made church into something like a social club or or feed me, feed me, feed me. We talk talk about that quite often. So, okay, that's a a valid point also. Anybody else thoughts on that? What if you could say, what do you think's wrong with the church? And I know this is very subjective, guys, because like I said, we all seem to know and there's even books out there about this that can't seem to ever nail anything to the wall like this is the problem you know some of what sarah's saying maybe just many churches are devoid of the presence of the holy spirit moving in our midst you know and that's huge right nothing happens if the spirit isn't here isn't moving and working anybody else thoughts about that okay Okay. Go deeper with that, John. Tell me, tell me what you mean by that specifically. Personality driven. Okay. That's what I'm wanting you to say. <laughs> when you say personality, you're saying that churches often take on the persona of who's in the pulpit. Um, okay. And that's very, very true. That's very true. And that's dangerous. Okay. Um, read a couple of articles this week. Y'all knew that I would. One was in the Christian Post. Was in the Christian Post. I don't know if y'all ever read the Christian Post, but it's got a lot of really good stuff in there from time to time. And and it had, of course, its take on um, what's wrong in the church. Um, the subtitle of this article um, was the title of the article was "What's Wrong with the Church," but the subtitle was this: "The Modern Evangelical Church is Sick Today." And it has to do with erring pastors. That's interesting. Erring pastors. And so, of course, I read the article and some of the stuff that it says. But basically, their assumption was that a lot of what we see today has to do with the church, with with the church, has to do with the people in leadership, with with pastors. And so, dig in a little bit deeper. Um, Our own Southern Baptist Convention, y'all know, owns Lifeway. That's our big Christian bookstore. And Lifeway now has branched out and has a whole research division, much like Barna Research or Pew or Gallup. Um, And in their research thing recently, um, this was the headline of this study that they just published. And it says this, Americans aren't sure they can trust pastors. And you go on and you read it, and they were surveying Americans to see you know, what their perceptions of the church is or what they think is wrong with the church. And it seems like almost every one of them came back and said, it has to do with the leadership. It has to do with those who are the leaders of the churches. Um, and I'm going to share some of these with you. And Sarah's going to put them up as I look at this. But some of these I found quite um, enlightening, frightening, uh, eye-opening, however you want to say it. Um, here's, here's what this research from Lifeway is, is revealing in this um, study they put out, Americans aren't sure they can trust pastors. Um, they discovered that almost seven in 10 U.S. adults say religious leaders act unethically at least some of the time. That's a lot. That's 69% say that religious leaders act unethically at least some of the time. And 10% of U.S. adults said religious leaders act unethically most of the time. Uh, that's perception, whether that's reality or not, that's what people think. The problem's leadership. Um, 53% of U.S. US adults believe that religious leaders rarely face serious consequences when they act unethically. In other words, they don't believe that the church rightly handles pastors who act unethically or who fail. Uh, 49% of U.S. adults say religious leaders rarely personally admit mistakes and take responsibility for their actions. These are perceptions of those who are leading our churches, okay? So that's interesting. Um, Generationally, young adults, 18 to 29, are less likely to trust religious leaders and more likely to see them as uncaring and irresponsible. 
The religiously unaffiliated have the lowest view of pastors and other religious leaders. And more than two in five, 43% say religious leaders care about people like them only a little or not at all compared to 19% of Christians who say they care about them. So just those statistics, I don't, I don't know what you hear in that, but it seems like they're saying there's a crisis of leadership in churches and that many people see that as the problem with churches today. Maybe they're onto something. Maybe we should. And, and what I think is interesting about that is when you read this passage of scripture in 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 25, you go, that must not be a new thing. There has to be a level of accountability that churches have with those who are in leadership. And I, I think that's powerful. You have a responsibility to not only provide for me, supporting me, you know, financially or whatever, but you have a responsibility to hold me accountable, to, to hold me to a high standard of what God calls ministers to be. And if I err, you have a responsibility to confront that. And get me back on track. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? I, and I don't think that's happening in our churches today. If you look at I, that article from Christian Post said that there are over 1,500 mega churches in our country right now. And that there are thousands of mega church pastors who have full authority in their church and answer to no one. That's dangerous, right? So, so think about that. And, and we're getting a perception that something's wrong with the church and nobody really knows what it is. Well, maybe it has to do with leadership. Maybe it has to do with pastors, with ministers, with, with teachers. And I think that's what Paul's talking about here. So let's kind of dig into it a little bit deeper, kind of pick it apart. There's two crucial safeguards for church leadership that perfectly divide these verses, okay? Uh, verses 17 through 25. It's kind of logically divided into two sections. So look at this. Uh, these are the two kind of crucial safeguards that this passage naturally divides itself into. And we'll kind of look at each one of these separately. But number one is the proper exercise of church discipline towards sinning or erring church leaders. The, the proper way to do it when, when pastors get off track or when pastors are erring or sinning, okay? There's a proper way to do it. And that's in verses 17 through 21. Okay, so we'll look at that one uh, separately here in just a minute. But that's the first half of this passage. The second half deals with the careful selection of church leaders. And that's verses 22 through 25, the last half. So, so think about that. There's a proper way to deal with erring or sinning leadership. And, but then the second half of it, Paul's going to say, you need to be careful who you select to be your leaders. And I think that's true. I, th I think we need to do a better job of being discerning about who we're putting in the pulpit, who we're putting in leadership positions. You know, you know how the church has done it so many times? And I laugh about this all the time because it happens in every church. Think about how we elect chairmen of committees. We joke about it, right? But we say we railroad them, right? They're not here, so we're going to elect them to leadership, right? To fill a position, that ought never to be in a church. The people that you put in leadership, either as a deacon, as an elder, as a minister, the person you're put, you ought to know them before they ever preach from that pulpit to you. You ought to know them. And, and listen, we're all guilty of that sometimes. We've got a position to fill. Let's fill it fast instead of fill it well, okay? So I, I think that's a dangerous thing. And if you think it's not, then just come hang around with me for a while and hear some of the conversations I have with different ones not even from this church, from other churches that call me and struggles that they're having. And it always comes back to this topic. Who's the leadership? And, and, and I, I'm just telling y'all, I, I can see this. When I, when I started doing this study, working on this, I'm like, th this is probably one of the biggest problems facing the church today is the crisis of leadership in our churches and how we deal with it. Well, well here's the deal. Listen, you are the church you have a responsibility, right, to hold those in leadership to accountability. You put them there, right, and you have a responsibility to hold us to accountability. But there's a proper way that has to be done. So let's look at these two parts of this passage and kind of pick it apart just a little bit. We said that 
first of all, um, the proper exercise of church discipline towards sinning or erring church leaders. He kind of deals with that in verses 17 through 21. So look at that passage with me, if you would. Look at verses 17 through 21 again and see if you don't see this in here. He's talking about um, here about how to prop the proper exercise for dealing with those who err. So the first part, verses 17 and 18, he talks about taking care of them, right? Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor. So honor them, right? Especially those who labor in the word and doctrine, honor them. For the scripture says, don't muzzle an ox while he's treading out the grain and the labor's worthy of his wages. So first two verses are what? Take care of him. You get it? But then this, do not receive an accusation um, against an elder except from two or three witnesses. It's an important standard there, okay? Um, proper exercise of how to deal with one who errs. T- verse 20, those who are sinning, rebuke. And there's a certain way to do it in the presence of all, that the rest also may fear. 21, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. Now, those two verses here address the subject, I think, pretty well of of how to properly address leadership that errs in some way, okay? Um, And there's some standards here to give that. If I was to ask you, um, I don't know how many of you keep up with this, but of course, we're affiliated with the Southern Baptist Convention. What's the biggest problem right now that within our convention that, that we're dealing with, besides kind of being watered down doctrinally in some areas? What, what's the big thing? Have y'all read any of it or seen any of it? That's one of them. That's one of them. The biggest thing we're dealing with right now is cover up of sexual sin scandals in our churches. That's what, that's what all the big fuss has been about lately is the cover up um, of, of hiding that within our executive board, some abuses of that power, sweeping it under the rug, hiring it, not uh, hiding it, not confronting it. Um, it's this very thing. Now, the other things you're mentioning are a part of that too. Um, and that's being all called up. Um, but that's the big one right now is, is, you know, all these cover-ups within churches. And y'all should read some of the statistics of that. It's alarming when you read of that, but that's happening. And, and in here, it tells us that's got to start on the local level with us holding ministers and pastors accountable. In verses 19 and 20, he addresses three aspects of proper discipline for church leaders. Okay, now, anytime you start talking about discipline within a church, people start squirming. Oh, you mean we're going to start churching people? Y'all remember that term we used to use way back when? We kicked people out of church and all that kind of stuff. That was very controversial, still is in my book. This is talking about erring leaders, pastors. It's not talking about pew sitters. It's not talking about you. It's talking about me. Like those who are in leadership positions, what do you do with that? Okay, how how do you handle that? And so he actually gives us three pretty good aspects of proper discipline for pastors, ministers, church leaders like myself. How does the church handle that? And that's key, okay? And I'm gonna say it again. Always with grace and mercy with the intent of restoration. Always. Please understand that. Anytime there is discipline within a church, the goal is not to run somebody off or kick somebody out. What's the goal? To restore them, to bring them back to spiritual health, right? To help them become who God's called them to be, all right? So that's key. So these things that Paul, that Paul gives Timothy here are very key. And I find a lot of grace, a lot of mercy in these that probably... Um, doesn't bode well for how we handle things today. But here's, here's the first one. Number one, these are proper, three proper aspects for discipline of church leaders. And these actually come from verses 19 and 20. Number one, proper discipline of church leaders requires factual evidence. Not hearsay, right? Not gossip, not accusation, right? That's not based on anything. And you say, well, where are you getting that? Here's Here's what Paul tells Timothy right off the bat. And evidently this was an issue that was probably causing Timothy to get ulcers. People are coming and saying, well, so-and-so did this and this and so-and-so did this and this and so-and-so, what are you going to do about it? 
And Paul, I can imagine Timothy said, Paul, what do I do? I'm getting all these accusations about, you know, leaders in the church and, and they're accusing of, but I don't see any evidence of it. What do I do? Look at verse 19. Here's what Paul said. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. What did he say? Timothy, if there's no evidence, dismiss it. There ought to be evidence. If an accusation comes and there's no witness to it, so always receive it. That sounds a lot like the law of Moses. In Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15, listen to what he said. A single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed. That's interesting. That's the law of Moses. Let me read it again. A single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. So what did he say? When we hear stuff in church that's hearsay, what should we do with it? Repeat it? No. What should we do with it? Yeah. I'm going to give you some questions to ask here in a minute when that comes. Do not repeat it. That's gossip. And now you're sinning, right? Right? So when we receive an accusation about something and, there, and, and it's just coming, we should dismiss it unless there's evidence, factual evidence. That's what he says. Paul specifically applies this to church leaders here because they're more liable to false accusations and slander. And here's what I see happens a lot of times. False accusations to um, a pastor are very dangerous in a church because what I've seen happen in my ministry and my years with some of my friends that I've known, a false accusation in the church, the church chooses sides immediately. Who are you going to believe, Right? And what, what happens immediately is the church divides over it, all right? Some will believe the pastor and some won't. Well, Paul here was concerned about that. So he says, listen, if it's a false accusation with no factual evidence, no witnesses to it, dismiss it. Don't destroy the reputation of the minister or the leader if, there's, if it's a false accusation, all right? Now, here's five questions that you should ask always to someone who brings a false accusation. To you as a church member, even to me as a pastor, if someone brings a false accusation to me against one of you, um, this is what you ought to ask. What is your reason for telling me this? And jot these down. I think these are very helpful. Widening the circle of gossip only compounds the problem, right? So what's your reason for telling me this? Why do I need to know this? Is If the person says, I just wanted you to know so you could pray, Nope. That's gossip, right? So, so do, you, do you see what I'm saying? That's uh, the first good question there. Um, I think that's, that's important. Um, second question, where did you get your information? Refusal to identify the source is a sure sign of gossip. Is there more than one independent witness to this? If not, the accusation should not be received and the accuser should be shown this scripture and warned about spreading false charges of another. 1 Timothy 5, 19. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. You see, so second question there, where'd you get your information? It's a good question. Where, where is this coming from? Well, so-and-so told me. Well, where'd they get their information? Well, someone told them. That's gossip, guys. Number three, have you gone to those directly involved? Why are you telling me, have you asked them? Nancy and I went through a situation. I'm going to share a lot of personal stuff here from my last church. We went through a situation in our church where there were some accusations leveled against Nancy and I. It had to do with the school. Um, and nobody in my church asked me, but one little old lady came to my house and she said, this is what I heard. Is it true? And Nancy said, there's not any truth to that. It's totally not true. And I appreciated that lady so much and always had so much respect for her. Other people talked about it. She asked about it. And I'm saying, if you care about somebody, you know, the thing to do is go talk to them about it. Say, don't go to other people. That's spreading gossip, right? 
But this question's a good one. Have you gone to those directly involved? Why are you telling me this? Go talk to them. I mean, their reputation's being destroyed by this rumor mill right here. Go talk to them about it. Um, here's number four. Have you personally checked out all the facts? It's easy for facts to get distorted as they travel from one person to another. It kind of reminds us of the old game Grapevine. Remember, when a, when a story starts here, by the time it gets through 10 people, it doesn't sound anything like it did over here. That's the gossip rumor mill, all right? And here's the fifth one, and this is a good one. Always ask this question. Can I quote you if I check this out? That puts a stop to it many times, Right? Um, because a person spreading gossip won't want to be quoted by name. They, they don't want to get involved in the messy business. They just want to pass it along to someone else because it's juicy. And sometimes that's affirming. I know something you don't know, right? So think about those five questions when false accusations come. And I think this first point is a very important one. And I think it's full of grace and protection, right? Proper discipline of church leadership leaders requires factual evidence, Someone comes to you with an accusation and there's nothing to back it up, dismiss it. So that's the first need. Second, proper discipline of church leaders requires public rebuke. Now, when we hear that, we wince, right? We go, oh gosh, let's, let's address it privately. Let's, let's address it secretly. Let's sweep it under the rug, Right? That's, that's our natural inclination. Think about that. But look what he says in verse 20, because he says this, and there's a reason, and we read it almost like this sounds too harsh. This sounds uncaring. Think about the purpose of this, okay? Who am I accountable to? As a leader in the church, as a pastor, who am I accountable to? You, right? And who should care for my soul? You, you. Of course I should, but you do, right? Who should care enough about me as a church family to come and say, listen, we're concerned about you in this. Is this correct? Is this, do you see what I'm saying? So I, I think there's some, some grace and love in this too. So proper discipline of the church requires public rebuke. Look at verse 20. Paul writes, those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear. The proper translation here is of those who are sinning or those who are erring, those who are going astray. It could be a reference to false teachers who were erring in God's word and sinning by leading people astray. It could also be the immoral behavior of some. Remember that Ephesus was a place where the, the temple was located and prostitution and sexual morality was rampant in that area, kind of a melting pot and everything was acceptable and so it could be all different kinds of things. Um, I think that's powerful. Remember Jesus' own instructions to us um, if someone has erred. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 17. This is on the screen, so you don't have to turn there. But here's what Jesus said. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his faults between you and him alone. That's important. Go talk to them. Don't come talk to me. Go Go, go confront them personally. If he hears you, you've gained a brother. What does that mean? You've helped him. You've helped to restore him. And he's repented of it. Verse 16. But if he will not hear, take with you one or more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. What did we say? Don't believe the accusation of one, right? If he won't hear you, take another as a witness. Verse 17. And if he refuses to hear them, Tell it to the church. But if he refuses to hear the church, then let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. So here we go, right? We're going to talk to him. We're going to take a witness if he doesn't hear. Church is going to publicly address it. And the idea here, again, is not to push them out or destroy them. It's to draw them back. What do you do, think about this, with heathens and tax collectors? What are we supposed to do with heathens and tax collectors? That's exactly right. We're to draw them in. We're to present the gospel to them. We're to help them see the light. We're to help them. This is not saying that we condemn them to hell. What's it saying that we do? We consider them a prospect to draw back in, to evangelize, to teach the truth of Jesus so that they see the truth 
and are restored. Do you see that? This passage is often misinterpreted. And I don't think that's Paul's intent either. The goal is never to blast the man, but to restore him. If he repents after private rebuke, it may be necessary for public rebuke. And I think that's very powerful. Um, here's our human tendency and inclination. I put this on your, on your deal tonight, and you don't have to um, write anything. There's no notes to take. This will be on the screen. Um, but I want you to think about this. I think this is our human tendency and inclination when leaders err, when those, if it's a pastor, or if it's a deacon or someone in the church errs, this is our human tendency and inclination. And it's very different than what Paul's telling Timothy here. I think, first of all, our inclination is this. If a church leader sins, we're inclined to try to cover it quickly, keep it under wraps. Why? Because we're so concerned it's going to damage the church, right? Or to gossip about it. That's the other one. Now think about that. We're very quick to try to hide it, sloop it under the rug, keep it under wraps, or to gossip. Now what's wrong with that approach? Yeah. It doesn't help the person who's sinning to sweep it under the rug. What else is wrong with it? You see anything else? Well, gossip's never good, right? You're spreading malicious things that could destroy someone, right? And let me tell you this too. Even if it's true, that doesn't make gossiping about it right, right? Now you're caught up in their sin with them because you've been a part of propagating it. Do you see? So that just because it may be accurate, if you're spreading gossip about it, you're guilty, right? So don't do that. So our inclination is to do that. And like we said a minute ago, that's one of the biggest problems that the Southern Baptist Convention is facing today is they've swept so many things under the rug, you know, and people are finding out about it. And what's happening is the leadership of our convention is losing trust. They're losing, you know, people who, who believe them now. Many have lost their pastor at their ministries and because uh, things have been swept into the book. Here's, here's another one of our human tendencies. We have a tendency to think if we expose it, it seems like it would damage the reputation of Christ or the church, so we hide it. Um, and so we kind of play hush-hush with the matter. Now, what's wrong with that approach? First of all, listen, that is a misunderstanding of the church, right? And, and here's what I always think. God is a big boy and he can handle his own reputation. He does not need us to protect his reputation, right? Now, we ought to honor him with how we live and our lives ought to glorify him, draw people to Christ. But we worry about his reputation and the reputation of the church. Listen, I just read to you what people think about the church. It's not favorable, right? The truth is we need to deal in truth. We we need to handle things and not hide them or try to hush them. And if you think about this, what's wrong with this approach is we're not helping anybody with it. We think it's going to damage, so we try to hide what's happened rather than dealing with it. And here's the third one. Often pastors who sin morally are just quietly moved to new places of ministry or they leave and they find another place to serve in ministry and they're likely to repeat the same offense. I know this firsthand. I'm telling you. I've dealt with this in my church, a minister who erred and was never confronted. And then it got bad. And I'm not going to give you details about it. But when I left that church and went to my next church um, and called to check on them, see how things were going, they'd hired that guy back. And he'd had moral failings and they never confronted it. Never so, so I'm just telling you, and here's the thing that a lot of times ministers and pastors who failed once, if it's swept into the rug and not dealt with, it'll reoccur. It will. And, and that's dangerous. So, so here's my thing. I'm not being harsh in that. I'm saying if we care about that person, we ought to help them be victorious in their life over that. We ought to be redemptive and restoring them. And the proper way for us to respond, what Paul's telling Timothy is, listen, as a church, take responsibility for that leader. Put your arms around him, encourage him. Some churches I know of have done this very well and some have not because here's our tendency, sweep it under the rug, just let it go. I, I know some of this stuff because I've dealt with some of it, so I get it. Uh, three affirming values of rebuke. 
before the church. Number one, public rebuke does clear the name of God in his church from association with the toleration of evil. Here's the deal today. Many times the church is seen as passive and watered down and doesn't teach the truth. Then teach the truth. Then call sin, sin. Talk about a redemptive God who redeems sinners. Talk, talk about that. Preach the truth. Okay, that's what clears the name of God and makes the church shine is when we're holding to what we believe in this book. Second, public rebuke causes others to be fearful of sinning. It holds us all accountable, right? When we realize that within this church, if I mess up, I have brothers and sisters that are, love me enough to come alongside me and say, hey, brother, you're, you're straying here. Do, do you see when you have people, what would you do with your child? If your child was straying and going into a dangerous direction, would you not correct him? Right? And we should be that way as a family of God. All right? All right, here's number three. Public rebuke causes the sinner himself to be fearful of sinning again. If he knows he's going to be held to account, what does that do? Hey, this church loves me enough to tell, them, tell me when I'm erring, and they're going to hold me accountable. I think that's a beautiful thing myself. All right? Here's number three. Um, about what he's talking about here. And this is in verse 21. Proper discipline of church leaders requires impartiality. Oh, but our pastor is so popular and he's drawing so many people in, we shouldn't confront that. He might get mad and leave. That's dangerous, folks. If because, because he's popular or liked, or, or, or do you see what I'm saying? If we're not willing to confront things because he's popular liked and it might damage our church if we confront it's better to hold to the truth of god right than to let something go like that so look what paul writes in verse 21 i charge you before god and the lord jesus christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice do nothing with partiality church discipline of leaders will be effective only if it's applied impartially if a man of influence is shown leniency, while a less powerful man is treated harshly, much harm is done to the church. We ought to hold to the truth. If it's wrong for one, it's wrong for another. And we ought to be impartial in that. Um, so that's, that's pretty powerful. Okay, so that's, that's the first half of this. Now, the second half of this in verses 22 through 25, to keep church leadership godly, elders must be selected carefully. And this is the part I really wanted to get to, and I'll have to go through it pretty quick. But I think this is what every church needs to know. How do we get good leaders in place? How do we get those who can serve in place? How do we do that? Okay. Now look what he says, verses 22 through 25. Listen to this. And I'll run through these fairly quickly, guys. I'll try to. Um, verse 22, do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in others people's sins. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water. Use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. Some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment, but those of some men follow later. Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident, and those who are otherwise cannot be hidden. Now that's, that's powerful, and I want you to see this because he's giving you some instructions right there on how to select carefully those who you put in leadership positions. And, and I think this is helpful. Um, two important encouragements here. Number one, the need for caution and God's timing in selecting church leaders. See what he says, don't lay hands on anyone hastily. Take your time. Find out what that individual's made of. Find out if their commitments are for real before you lay hands on them and anoint them for leadership positions. Do you see that? Nor share in other people's sins. In other words, Sometimes we lay hands on someone and put them in a leadership position without really knowing the things that are going on in their life. And thereby we've put in leadership a person who really shouldn't be there because of things in their life. They're not ready for leadership. And you know what we've done? We've done them great harm as much as we have the church, right? They won't be able to hold up under the pressure of it. And yet we've all of a sudden put them in a leadership position they're not mature enough yet to handle. We've set them up for failure. See, I think the church is responsible for that. And I think that's a part of what Paul's talking about here. So that's very important. So don't lay hands on anyone hastily. All right, the second thing is the need for careful observation and discernment in selecting church leaders. And I think in verses 23 through 25, he talks about this one, all right? 
And, and in the middle of that, I think he sensed, okay, I need to encourage Timothy here. Timothy, I know this is getting the best of you. All of these instructions, they're hard. Listen, take care of yourself. Take a little wine for your stomach. Your, you know, your stomach lining is being wasted on worrying about all of these things. Just be wise, you know, as you select leaders. So he talks here, I think, about careful observation and discernment when selecting leaders. Now, I think it reveals two classes of men, those who are fit for office and those who are unfit for office, verses 24 and 25. He specifically says it. Two observation reveals kind of two classes of men here, those who are unfit and those who are fit. Verse 24 says, some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment, but those of some follow later. So that's why you got to be careful and discerning, right? So some who come are unfit because immediately you know the things going on in their life, they're unfit, right? They shouldn't, they shouldn't be in those positions. Others hide it well. That's what he said. Others hide it well. Some men follow later. What's he saying? Time will tell, right? But some are able to conceal it. There's hypocrisy at play here. And then there's those who are fit, verse 25. Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. So same thing. Some, their good works go before them and you know, hey, this person will make a great leader. And then there's others who we underestimate and time will tell how good that one really is. There's some who are quiet, servants, heart leaders, and we only recognize it with time, right? That they'd, they'd make great leaders. So those are good, all right? All right, I got time to finish this up. Guys, there's so much more here to share, and it's such good stuff. So important for the church, I think. But let me give you these three concluding considerations. And these are true, and I'm teaching this, I think, like Paul was telling Timothy, and also like we need to hear it. Number one, Dealing with erring church leaders is never easy. It's not easy. And I don't think we ought to pretend that it is. This is the hard way, not the easy way. But remember, just because something is difficult or hard doesn't mean that it's not necessary and best. There are proper ways to handle things biblically. And as a church, I think we ought to be biblical. Second, it is harmful to both the church and the individuals involved, not to deal with it. It's harmful. Harmful to the church, and it's harmful to those involved. Why? Because usually there's a victim, right? Who if you dismiss it or sweep it under the rug, you've said they don't matter. And then there's the person who erred, right? Who you're sweeping under the rug, so they're never held accountable, so they can't be restored, and they can never grow. You can't be healed of a problem you don't think you got, Right? And it's bad for the church because you've got a leader that isn't where he ought to be spiritually. Third, this must be done biblically and with the right heart attitude. This is a big one to me. Paul's given us some instructions here at how to deal with it. I think it should be done biblically. And if you read and do it biblically, it's not done harshly. It's not attacking. It's not malicious. It's not hateful. And it's not destructive. It's always done with restoration and redemption in mind. And I'll stop there because my time's up. Good stuff, y'all. Next week, we'll pick up chapter six. We're close to finishing this thing up. Um, I, think, I think it's gonna, chapter six is gonna be just like this. It's hard. It's gonna <laughs> throw some more stuff at us, but it's good. Observations, questions, anything anybody wants to add tonight? <coughs> yes. We think he was about 15 when he was saved. Um, and everything that I read, he could have been anywhere from 25 down to 20 years old. He's young. So this is maybe five to 10 years after he became a Christian. So he's young. But evidently, Keith, to me, when I read this, I think Timothy must have been very gifted. I don't think Paul would have left Timothy at this strategic church if Paul hadn't have seen how called and gifted of God he was and discerned his abilities. But I think Timothy doubted his abilities, which isn't uncommon for leadership, I think a lot of times do. But we, we don't know. It would be total speculation, but 20 to 25 is what I think you kind of hear or read a lot.
Anybody else? You can try to answer it. Thank you guys for coming tonight. Hope that wasn't too heavy. It seems like every lesson from Timothy is pretty heavy, isn't it? Let me lead us in a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for how direct and personal it is, how hard-hitting it is, and God, yet how truthful. And God, I just feel like that in our day, we need truth. Um, God, to address many of the things that are um, weighing down and burdening the church today. And God, I pray that you would raise up godly men and women to lead that would hold forth the truth. God, that would be honorable and blameless before you like many of those in Scripture. God, not perfect because none of them were perfect but who are fully surrendered to you to be empowered by your Holy Spirit to lead your people. God, we need that today. And I pray that you would raise those up in the church. Bless us even tonight as we go from this place that God, our heart might be, God, to draw others to you, to be redemptive and restorative in our own life towards those who are outside the faith and to draw them to you. And even in our own life, God, to check ourselves, to see that we are what we ought to be as believers. Bless our choir as they rehearse tonight and get ready for worship on Sunday. Excite us about that opportunity to be again to, together again to worship you. It's in your name we ask these things. Amen. Thank you, guys. God bless y'all.